All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming by. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you how Hexagon approaches the topic of AI in a lot of different examples that you're about to see. Uh, my name is Janis Mounts. I'm the Vice President of Artificial Intelligence here at Hexagon. Um, it's exciting times to show, uh, to give this presentation in particular, uh, because there's so much things we can show. We only have 20 minutes, so if you're interested in more, um, I can show you ways how to find it and experience it. How does Hexagon see AI, and specifically in the teams that we work with? At the end of the day, it's all about outcomes that we can provide. Turning data into outcomes, whether that's in a sensor, whether that's in an application, in a desktop software, in the cloud. Um, it's quite important. We do bridge the gap from, let's say, the deep tech environment into outcomes at our customers, and whatever doesn't make sense, we hopefully discover, but then relatively quickly stop as well. You've seen yesterday, um, Hexagon is rich of sensors that we develop ourselves, whether that is in the manufacturing space with individual uh, coordinate measurement machines, laser trackers, articulated arms, and the likes, as well as in the geosystems area, where um, we have many different ways to capture data in two- and three-dimensional space over time with unprecedented quality. Why is that important? Well, if you work on AI, data is the most important part. And because we develop these sensors ourselves, we can always go just around the corner, speak to the team so that we know exactly how each and every point in space, let's say, has been come to uh, uh, exist. And thereby, we know exactly what to do with the data going forward. And being close in the industry, we can then bring that into an outcome. Yesterday, you've heard a lot about the term spatial intelligence, where spatial intelligence is not particularly a new term, but not known broadly. So I thought some theory lessons here as well. Uh, when we talk about spatial intelligence, it's basically three things that all of you here do on a regular basis, which is to perceive, to reason, and to actuate. You've seen a good example with E.ON yesterday, and I hope you had the time to spend it at the booth today where basically you sense that does not only need to be vision, it can as well be sound, haptics, or LiDAR in our case. Then you reason, OK, where am I? Where do I need to go? What task do I have? And then you actually go and execute on that task. But it doesn't only apply to EON. It applies to scanners. It applies to CMMs. And not all the time. It's all three at once. Sometimes we take care by creating a digital twin for the perceive and to some extent reason, whereas the users then continue with reasons and decisions, whether they're on site, in the office. A good example is um, when we look at cities on a city scale. Uh, one of the cities very dear to my heart is uh, the city of Klagenfurt. What you can see here is not a drone footage, but that's a photorealistic three-dimensional digital twin of the entire city that's captured every two years. And thanks to AI and the uh, detection of the land cover classes, which we then feed into the meshing process, we can get these high fidelity, super crisp digital twins. The city, and it's available to the general public, makes use of these digital twins for a lot of different items, such as um, they use it to make planning decisions for uh, internal and external dimension of a building, how much solar potential there is, uh, what impact concrete surfaces have to the city climate, and how greenery can actually counter these impacts for heat waves and the likes. Uh, it's been, since it's captured every two years, this started in 2021 with publicly owned buildings where they started to simulate uh, how many solar cells could be there. In 2022, they actually installed these, and in 2023, we measured again. And down to the square inch, we could say the increased amount of square footage of solar in the city. And why they do it is because they are part of the um, top 100 smart cities in Europe to become climate neutral by 2030. Klangfurt not only wants to be there, but they measure how they get there on a year-by-year -year basis and can really steer and control and manage. Last year, we had the distinct pleasure that the BBC was curious about us uh, wanting to know. You see it on the QR code. There is a five and a half uh, minute documentary the BBC filmed with Hexagon and the city of Klagenfurt. Really nice story that you have there to see. 
let's zoom a bit in and go to Rails. Rails is uh, particularly a good example. When you capture the rail network of, let's say, a country like, let, presume Switzerland or Italy, you have one challenge if you do that. Um, first, you can take a car. You need to mount uh, the sensor on the train. Secondly, Switzerland is particularly known for having on-time trains. You can't just uh, drive among it with just a tenth of the speed. These trains need to run at passenger speed, 80 to 100 miles an hour. The sensors that can capture still enough detail are the ones that Hexagon produces, and there is hardly a second one. We then take it forward, what you can see here, terabytes of 3D data, which our classification models then uh, decompose into the individual classes that those who actually have mapped the assets basically can focus on the essence. How much vegetation is there? Are the train beds okay? What's the distance between power lines and the vegetation around? They can basically fly through this with the power of HXDR, just have a look at those, collaborate and make the decision based out of that. Plus, of course, they have a high fidelity documentation for the future. Zooming in again for factories, it's once again the same patterns, but here you would want to think in a room as such, I would like to scan it. At the moment, there's quite many people, and the factories is the same. How can I get rid of what's currently in the factory and plan new production workflows for different car brand? Coming in a few months later this year, these workflows will be available where you can basically do that on HXDR via ClientWorks uh, workflows. So you no longer need to take care to have large compute on your devices. You basically scan, upload it, press a button, and then just focus on the essence, which basically means a factory for you to design the new workflows before you actually go into implementation. And because factories are buildings, I thought I'll bring an example of buildings as well, because that's something that we have been uh, working on for quite some time. Here, the difference is uh, um, on top of the as-built scan that we do, we compare that against the BIM model of a building that's in construction. Of course, we can do the classification, but the best part is we can map what is in the point cloud to the BIM model and the objects within that. And that basically, we, we discovered two things, geometrical deviations, so to say, so you can see whether the as-built scan deviates from uh, um, the BIM model, but at the same time, we can also see whether things are already built or not. And if you have this information, this you can easily then transfer into a schedule of time and a schedule of cost or schedule of value. The outcome here is budget control. Our clients love it because at the end, it's not one single family home that they build. It's large uh, uh, buildings or facilities, and you need to keep oversight over your budget at the end of the day. And AI is really a strong assistant here helping them just keep the oversight over these uh, uh, budgets that they need to pursue. If we go forward, uh, I continue to be astonished by the amount of complexity you have in an industrial facility. Um, on both sides being there and at the same time how challenging it is uh, for our teams to actually make models used in such an environment. There is no plug and play way and neither is there an automatic workflow, but what we can do is make the lives of people easier to get to the final result. Here, we basically get rid of anything that's not a pipe run and as of today, people then get basically can, can go through and just click by click select the correct pipe run to be modeled. This is already a huge leap forward as opposed to in the past flying through millions of points with a lasso and trying to model uh, 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 tuboids or spheres in there. But it doesn't stop there. Earlier this year, we made it even easier for people to work with point clouds in the first place. By using AI technologies in the cursor, we made it as natural as possible, where people say, well, this is a car. So now, if they click on it actually with the AI feature that helps them select it actually, basically pretty much detects what they uh, anticipate to select with them, again, to get them much faster, much easier from various positions. This can be done in the example here with just the car, but as well, or furthermore, um, you, can, you can apply that universally. Whenever you have the scans and the colors, it works just extraordinarily well. So here you remove it because it's of no interest, and the same works here for this tank. This tank is built into a complex structure, 
and you would want to take the high fidelity result of it. So you look at it from several angles, select it, but in a three-dimensional space, we basically take care of the rest so that, um, again, it's really swift and sweet where you can go through. This happens in real time on your desktop machine. This is the way how we make sure that this is as broad in use as practical. Um, if we move forward to the edge, um, this is something that you may have seen and again is a project which I think is outstanding when you think things from end to end. You have seen in the last two days the Leica ICS50, which is just over there for you to watch later. It's a tool where craftsmen can do very precise as-built measurements with a simple thing such as a pen. How does this work? Well, it's all well thought through. First, the sensor tracks the pen in real time and it's processed on the sensor at the edge. But the reason why this is working is because it was thought through from the beginning. We have a pen, we need six degrees of freedom of that pen, which means we need to have a distinct pattern that from any orientation, we basically in real time get back to the sixth off position of the tip of the pen because that's where you measure at the end of the day. And the reason why this works is because these spheres are manufactured specifically to serve the purpose that it's real-time possible and people at the end focus on the tool and not the, uh, on their job and not on the tool or the technology. That's ultimately the outcome you want to have. Make people more productive, less waste, less rework for them. And that's basically what we thought through here. Safety on construction sites is something that came up this morning uh, with Henning and as well here. Uh, quite an exciting application of artificial intelligence. With the Leica XI 360, you basically can mount it on any machine equipment, in this case an excavator. These are 360 degree cameras that look around, you define a perimeter, combine it with the excavator's uh, systems, and basically when they get to work, they have a small indicator in the cockpit where if people are within that perimeter, they get a warning such that there is less incidence, more safety, and of course, uh, higher productivity at the end on the construction side. This has been announced here at Hexagon Life. Go visit it in the zone. It's quite an impressive uh, project that we started with, and it will go a long way. Looking over to manufacturing, the whole spatial intelligence at the edge is something as well here that we thought through. Um, you need high fidelity measurements down to the micrometer at large scale. The camera here identifies the features to be measured. Once it knows the features from large areas, the measurement trajectories are developed to provide highest speed and throughput. And then the measurement as always, and as it always been, is down to the microm at the highest possible accuracy. At the end, less work for the user, higher insurance that, that things work. Now you've seen quite a few examples, um, and one project that is not in here in the zone, but at the entrance areas, which is the very wide booth, is a project quite near and dear to my heart, which is uh, the measuring, measuring the most complex surface on the Earth, which is the human face. Here, our team has spent a lot of time to make sure we get a 3D digital twin of the human face when it comes to age groups, genders, ethnicities, skin types. And there's a few takeaways I can tell you, but one for sure is, if you're ever going to take a selfie, do it between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. Trust me, that's the time of the day where your face looks the best. <laughs> Just if you want to take one takeaway, and it's still about time, so afterwards I encourage everyone to take this capture of your face. Uh, it's a stunning what we could do. And nobody would have seen a measurement company showing up in the aesthetic industry. This is extraordinary, unique, because a static company historically don't have the measurement competences, whereas we basically come from that arm. We wouldn't be here in this position if we wouldn't be working with many partners that we have. The ones of which you can see here, whether that is AWS with their hyperpods helping us now decrease cycle times for training deep learning models, it's just almost, I would say, insane and, and super useful. Whether that's Microsoft helping us with uh, Gen AI tools for auto-labeling techniques as well as generative assistance for both products and using in our own company, 
NVIDIA, I don't think, need to mention a lot and the association with AI, but specifically for us, we have a good collaboration on both research and productization so that we can get to know the people, the authors behind certain techniques and bring those into products on the construction side, in the field, on the shop floor. And OpenAI helps us really to stay on the forefront of their frontier models so that we can have an early shot on what the latest and greatest capabilities are and how we can bring that into customers' hands in the usual trusted and reliable way, which is a phrase easy to say but hard to do. I can just mention from, from personal experience. With this influx of Gen AI, one thing that has happened as well for us, first acceptance for AI and solutions has increased significantly, which is a good thing. But also many things tend to now just say, yeah, yeah, well, it's just yet another AI and assistant. Well, you know, it all, everything has a positive and a negative side. One thing I can definitely tell here with a kind of a symbolic representation, the amount of solutions and improvements that we have been able to do to complement workflows, to create new ones, just has extraordinarily accelerated. Where it used to be one or two releases a year, some years back, it now has just skyrocketed. And of course, we don't show the roadmap, but you can trust me, we have no intention to stop nor to slow down. So it's been really a phenomenal journey. And anything that I've shown today is basically we take data into outcomes because when it has to be right, it has to be hexagon. And all of what you've seen today, go visit at the zone. This is not fiction. Try it with your own hands. Talk to Eon and the others. And I'm happy to do similar presentations in the future with even more and more things to come. Thank you so much and enjoy Hexagon Live.